Hi everyone, it's Reed here, one of your co-hosts. Uh, unfortunately, this week, if you've tuned in to hear Nathan and my take on Dario Argento's uh, classic giallo suspense thriller Suspiria, we have a bit of bad news. Um, unfortunately, after recording that episode, we discovered that due to a glitch in the software, um, it had only captured small fragments of our conversation, and scheduling constraints made us unable to re-record that conversation in time for this week. Um, we do have a plan, not only to share our thoughts on Argento's original, but also on last year's remake as well. So stay tuned for that uh, sort of take two episode in the coming weeks. But meanwhile, we have something else for you this week that we think you'll really enjoy. Um, Bill Oberst Jr. Uh, is a very noteworthy figure in the world of independent horror, including some recent work in Ryan Murphy's TV show Scream Queens, and uh, he was part of Rob Zombie's latest release, Three from Hell. He has nearly 200 uh, film and television credits, multiple awards over the past 12 years, so uh, to call his output prolific would be a profound understatement. Um, but despite his tendency to be cast as monsters and madmens and, and, and often even the devil himself, Bill's also a devout man of faith and is tremendously kind, generous, with a very humble spirit. I had the privilege of meeting him a few years ago at an event called Alpha Omega Con. It's a um, Christian pop culture and comics convention in Southern California. And he and I both participated in a panel on whether or not Christians could watch horror movies. So we spoke extensively at the event and then stayed in touch over the next few years uh, to the point that I'm proud to call him a personal friend. And Bill was gracious enough to give a couple of hours of his time for an open-ended conversation with me about his work, his personal philosophies, his approach to his career, and what it means to live a life of faith um, among monsters and madmen in the horror world. Uh, we had intended this conversation to air at a different time, but the recent loss of the Suspiria episode presented us with a chance to share it with you now. Uh, it's an open, honest, free-flowing conversation uh, with someone that I deeply respect and admire, and I really think you're going to enjoy it. So Nathan and I are going to be back next week with our usual format, the complete countdown of your top 20 favorite horror films of the 1970s and a full conversation about Richard Donner's film The Omen uh, that we think you're really going to enjoy. Uh, but in the meantime, kick back, relax, and enjoy this conversation that really uh, challenged and inspired me on a personal level uh, with the award-winning horror icon and my good friend, Bill Oberst Jr. Enjoy. There's nothing to fear except God. Whatever that means to you. Do I look like someone who cares what God thinks? You're listening to a podcast exploring faith and fear, what scares us and what saves us. This is The Fear of God. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Fear of God podcast, where we explore the holy and the horrific at the intersection of faith and fear, searching for what scares us in order to find what saves us. Now, I am one of your co-hosts, Reed Lackey, and typically, <laughs> uh, typically with me is uh, Nathan Rouse. It's funny, I am realizing I am now years old when I am realizing that we open every single episode with a silly little bit about how one of us is off gallivanting and doing some strange adventure, and then really we're just waiting off mic to come in and join the conversation. But listeners, this time around, it is actually not a joke, it's not a set up for a bit. Unfortunately, my uh, longtime friend of over two decades now, uh, my beloved friend Nathan Rouse, is not with us at the moment um, because this is a very special episode, um, and unfortunately, he was just simply not able to uh, make it because at the moment, he is gallivanting off on vacation with his family, celebrating his birthday as he very well deserves. 
So instead, I have another very special guest with me, um, a good friend of mine uh, who I've been privileged to talk with over these past few years. Um, he is an incredibly prolific actor. Um, his IMDb credits are a small mountain, uh, but also uh, is very interested in a profound amount of uh, great stage work and theater work. He travels all over the country, uh, perhaps even all over the world. We'll get the chance to talk to him about it. But I would like to welcome uh, legendary horror actor and my dear personal friend, Bill Oberst, Jr. Bill, thank you for being on the show with me today. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Of course, of course. I'm delighted. This is, so we've been trying to work this out for what feels like since the inception of the show. So I'm glad that this finally got to be here. The um, uh, I, I want to set up one brief thing for the listeners. Um, they have heard your voice before, perhaps in a context that they may or may not remember. Uh, you, in the first before we had our first anniversary... Nathan and I had wanted to do an episode of the podcast uh, about Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, and I had reached out to you to see if you would be willing, possibly, to do a dramatic reading of that piece that we could insert in the actual live episode, which you were so gracious to do. Really powerful reading. Listeners, if you have not heard our episode on The Raven, go check that out, because Nathan and I talk about the piece uh, in general, but you're also treated in the midst of the episode to a dramatic reading by Bill himself. So thank you again for that. I really appreciate it. Oh, totally, man. Don't get me started on poetry. In fact, I already pulled a poem to read today. Ooh, awesome. I'm very excited. I'm, ex- I'm so anxious to see where this, where this conversation is going to go. I have so much I want to talk to you about. But uh, why don't we start uh, just very briefly with uh, just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, as little or as much as you want, uh, maybe a general brief bio, how you got started in the industry and, uh, and what it is you do. Uh, just, yeah, say as much as you want. Well, let me first, before I forget, because Reed probably won't do this, listeners, and Reed may have done this. He may not be as humble as I think, but I'll bet he is. <laughs> Reed has a movie coming out, oh, I think, man. around Easter. Yes. It's called XL, The Temptation of Christ, and it's done with director Douglas Vale, and Reed wrote the screenplay for it. Um, oh, thank you, Bill. And, yeah, so you should look that up, XL, The Temptation of Christ, Read Lackey and look forward to it as I will be looking forward to it. Oh, thank you, Bill. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that very, very much. So um, that's, that's for me, I am the Salieri of the film world. <laughs> the Salieri of horror. That's what I call myself. Yeah. <laughs> I love uh, it. Yeah, that, that 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 pretty much describes what I do. Oh, that's awesome. So you just uh, you, you are you are the one now. As I remember that play, uh, Salieri deems himself uh, the uh, the prince of mediocrity. And I, yes. I I have seen your I have seen your films, Bill. You are far superior an actor to to that. I have seen quite a few of your films, and I'm actually very very uh, happy and proud with everything you do, even if I don't like the film. Even if most of the, uh, like if if the situation is such that I don't care for the film I've just seen, I'm always like, but man, Bill's very very good at what he does. <laughs> You're an actor's actor, I would say. Thank you, man. I do. I I love being an actor. Um, I dislike the conflation of my craft acting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with fame or with celebrity. In fact, I think it's very very destructive, not only for the actor. Mm. Uh, but for the audience, it's it's um, it's almost so destructive that it strips away what being an actor is all about and what actors are supposed to bring. This what actors are supposed to bring to society is the same thing writers bring to society. Mm. Is that when you inhabit other people's lives repeatedly and a variety of other people's lives, you do a lot of deep thinking about uh, what makes us different and what we have in common. And it's that that that's what we're supposed to be bringing to the world, not walking along. Um, flipping red carpets. And, I mean, the red carpet right. is that that's become everything. The whole idea of um, celebrity makes me cringe because celebrated for what? Just mm-hmm. because a thing is celebrated, it doesn't mean that it's laudatory or worth imitating. Right. And this right. read is why I'm the salary of horror because with this attitude, I'm uh, I'm not going to be the Mozart. You know, I'm. Mm. I'm always pushing against the idea of, oh, you need to do, you need to be bigger, you need to do bigger stuff, you need to get a right, higher right. profile, and it, it, that is repulsive to me because it doesn't have anything to do with, well, I love doing what I do, and I just let God open whatever doors He wants, and I'll walk through them. Yeah, see, Bill, this, Bill, this is why we're friends, is because you have that, because you have that attitude and that approach. I remember saying, um, obviously, everyone would love, I believe. 
to reach a place where they can they can look back at what they've done and felt like this was good work. This was this was good. I'm proud of this. Um, or at least if I'm not proud of the work that was done, I'm proud of how I did it. And I'm proud of the way that I navigated it. Um, I, I remember thinking uh, in terms of uh, from the writing perspective that I was thinking like I would I would much rather be a part of projects where I got to feel fulfilled creatively and got to feel like I really put myself into it in a way that was substantial and that I was enriched by the experience and that perhaps the right audience will be enriched by engaging with the experience than I would you know, sort of reading the market or understanding the market and, and sort of navigating the how do I climb the ladder to, uh, to reach this place of status. Um, because then I believe it was actually noted... Um, Atheist lawyer Clarence Darrow, who is cited with this quote, but it's a quote that stayed with me a long time. He said, I wish someone had told me that when you reached the top, there was nothing there. And, yeah, it's really, really good. That's and, really, really good. It's so many biographies. I just read a biography of David Brinkley, the um, NBC News oh, yeah, man, yeah. and um, they, someone asked Brinkley you know, what it was like with the Emmys and the many awards, and he says, well, it can be fun. As long as you don't drink the water, mm, mm. and and that's so true. And then you go back to Mark Twain. Oh, you know what, what's it like, Mark? You're you're he was a legend in his lifetime, and Twain said the life has never been lived, which was not a disappointment in the secret judgment of the one who lived it. Mm. So no, there isn't anything yeah. up there. There isn't anything out there. Lo, the kingdom of God is within you. That's, I mean, to say that's true sounds almost sacrilegious. Of course, it's true, but it really, literally is true. <laughs> right? No, it's Ain't true. Nothing yeah. else. The rest is illusion. Yeah. And um, illusion's cool. Sure. But at this point, there has to be uh, behind all the distractions. There's got to be a plateau. You know, a tableland, a base where mm. we can sit, stand, stomp our feet, and say, "This is rock." Mm, yeah. This is rock. Right. This right. is rock. That mm. little rock place. Yeah, and this, I am no good at parties. Don't get me started. <laughs> no, no, no. This is this is why our listeners show up to this show is for these kinds of conversations. I uh, so on that note, one of the things that I've uh, been sort of loosely following over these past years is uh, you do a lot of main stage work. You do a lot of uh, my. Uh, I got my degree in theater arts. Nathan did as well. Uh, you do a lot of live stage work, and uh, t can you talk a little bit about that? Just uh, I do. I did stage for a living, nothing but stage for 14 years. It's all I ever wanted to do, and then I started messing around with movies and TV quite by accident in 2007, and so I've been doing that for seven, 17, oh my lord, 12 years, <laughs> almost as long as stage. Um, and I make my living doing movies and TV, and it's great. And um, you know, it's it's good. I enjoy all the projects, sure. but I I have been missing stage, um, which I had to to establish yourself in movies and TV. You have to abandon everything else, um, and having gotten as established as I really wanted to be in movies and TV, where I was working regularly, I wanted to go back to stage. So um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 I've been doing that uh, for the last couple of years, preparing to go back to stage, which I've just started to do, and I do it in between. The movies and the TV. So yeah, so it's a, uh, what I like to get to is a fifty-fifty mix because I really do love stage also. That's awesome, and I know you. Uh, so please redirect me or correct me if I if I'm getting these these uh, data points incorrect. Um, I believe you did uh, a one-man version of a Christmas Carol that you've done that, that you performed that several times. Is that correct? Am I remembering yeah, this right? Yeah, I I'll still do it. That's right. It's a rip off of um, John Luke Picard. Remind oh. me of his name. How oh, Patrick Stewart? That? Yeah, Patrick Stewart. Oh, God, this is what getting old's like. Yeah, <laughs> it's a ripoff of Patrick Stewart, uh, just as I toured with Twain for years. Mm -hmm. It was a ripoff of Hal Holbrook. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, right. it's a right. Christmas guy. So now I've developed something that I hope people can rip off of me later on. <laughs> so that's a rip off of Oberst. Um, I contacted the estate of Ray Bradbury, my mm. favorite author, yeah. three and a half years ago, and we started a process of discussions and licensing agreements, which have finally led to me having the rights to, um, with their blessing mm -hmm. and their approval of the script, to uh, prepare a solo stage portrayal of Ray. And uh, we've done it uh, once in New York, once in L.A., and um, a couple of, I think I've done like 10 performances total, 
Mm. And I'm preparing right now to start aggressively trying to uh, move it out there because next year will be Ray's 100th birth anniversary. Mm. So that, oh that's my, my stage baby. That's and that's amazing. That's something that you and I share. Ray Bradbury is a favorite author of mine. He and uh, for for me personally, he and Stephen King have always kind of uh, duked it out in terms of who uh, who holds the top spot for me if I were making a ranked list. And how I've delineated the two is I said I think King's overall body of work might mean a bit more to me, but the there are a a select hand few, handful of Bradbury's works that I just I think are unparalleled to anybody except for maybe Dickens. Like specifically, obviously Fahrenheit 451, everybody talks about Martian Chronicles, Illustrated Man, October Country. But Something Wicked This Way comes, which I, it, can we talk about Something Wicked This Way comes for a few minutes? I didn't really plan yes. on doing this, but yes, I'd love to. Something Wicked This Way comes is one of my is is it's a special book to me. To say it's one of my favorites is a is actually a decrement from where I ha, from how I actually feel about it. Um, I, something wicked this way comes. I think in some ways hit me at a time. First time I read it, I was about 14 years old, and it struck me in ways that I'm still probably trying at nearly 40 now to to calculate and trying to understand exactly the impact that it that that it has had on me. Um, the 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 general narrative of something we could this way comes if listeners don't know it is just basically these two boys um, are spending their fall October is a great month for boys as the book opens and they're spending their fall just navigating their world but a carnival has come into town and this carnival is uh, is uh, lecherous and it is very dark and it has malignant forces and malignant individuals running it, uh, supernaturally malignant individuals running it. And so the base narrative is just basically about this dark carnival coming to town. Uh, Halloween comes early that year, as the book says, and, uh, and, and its effect on the town all around it. But what I love about so much of Bradbury's works, this is something, Bill, you and I have talked about uh, off mic, as it were, um, is that I love that Bradbury's books are not really about the story itself. It's like the story is an excuse to say all the things that are on Bradbury's heart and mind. Would you agree with that? Yeah. um, Bradbury himself said this, that the whole purpose of a novel is not the plot. Mm. Um, He used to – he got very frustrated when he would try to describe a story idea to someone – who didn't know him or understand him, and they'd fixate on the plot. And he'd say, it's not about the plot. It's like A novel is about the asides. Mm. It's, it's, it, it's only the plot is just a, like a framework to give the characters structure within which they can have these asides and these discussions. Um, and yeah. the best example of that in Bradbury's work is in uh, Something Wicked This Way comes in the library. When Charles Holloway has this central, pivotal scene, and Ray thought it was, at the time, he thought it was the best thing that he ever possibly could write. Oh, wow. He was that passionate about it. Um, because Holloway delves into good, evil. Do they exist? What are they? How can he explain this to these young boys just before he has to face the evil in Mr. Dark? Uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, when you read it, it's, you can hear. <sighs> I will tell you, let me, let me back up for a second, since sure. we have the time to back up on your show. Yeah, absolutely, by all means. Okay, in putting together the Ray Bradbury show, uh, I worked with Dr. Jonathan Eller. He's the author of three Bradbury biographies, and he's the director of the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies at Purdue University. Okay. In Indiana State, Illinois. They've got all of Ray's papers. They've got all of Ray's books. They've got Ray's entire basement office. Everything went there. It was all shipped from Los Angeles. Mm. So they have the Emmys, the Hugo, the Oscars. They've got old uh, tapes. Um, they've got Ray's ties. He saved every scrap of paper, all the correspondence, his dinosaurs. Everything's there. Oh, wow. So I've been there several times to do research, and John was my script advisor. And the last time I went there was to do a performance there in Indianapolis so John could see the show. Okay. And uh, at the morning that I was going to leave, uh, we wanted to have breakfast, so we had breakfast. And we talked about his latest Bradbury biography, which is the final part of the trilogy. And then John said, do you want to go by the center? It's closed today, but I need to pick up some stuff. And I was like, yeah, I always want to hang out in Ray's office. <laughs> oh, so we went God. by the center, and we went in, and everything's covered up with um, cellophane and plastic because they were having some problems with moisture. Okay. And um, 
usually you never get left alone in there with Ray's files, you know, because they're one of a kind. Right, of course. And John says, you know what, Bill, at this point, I trust you. He says, look, he says, look at some files. I got to go to the office and do some things. Um, He says, so he pulls up. The, the plastic off the files. There's race filing cabinets. Oh, everything. No. And he said, um, he said, have a ball. Have a ball. I'll be back. Oh, my so gosh. I pull, I pull open a, a drawer and I open it. I pull out a thick manila fire folder and I start reading and I read a part of the library scene from Something Wicked. And I was, what is this? It's the manuscript. Oh, it's man. the manuscript for Something Wicked. And Ray apparently was reworking this manuscript, trying to turn it into a movie. And oh, man. Crushed. So I, I pulled out these pages of the manuscript and held them in my hand. And there were two thoughts. One, everything that we think is iconic existed because somebody did the work. Mm-hmm. Here in my hands was the work. Here was the typing. And two, <laughs> unlike, speaking of Salieri and Mozart, the myth, which is a beautiful myth, is that everything came from Mozart's head as if it had come down to him from heaven. Right, 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 right. There's, there's even a scene in uh, the movie Amadeus which uh, propagates this myth, which, is, again, is a beautiful creative myth. Everything just comes out. So right, here's right. Ray's text, and Ray has crossed out sections of it angrily. <laughs> <laughs> and he's written, no, 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 with a little frowny devil. Oh, and then wow. Pages, but why? Change. Change this. No. Why? Mm, wow. And I'm thinking, this great seminal work did not come about straight out of heaven. It was right. revised, 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 revised. And even at this point, Ray wasn't happy with it. And he was going back mm, and, changing mm. and changing and changing it. Um, and, I, and I sat there with the papers and I, I cried. I mean, I'm a grown man oh, sitting. Of course. But still, yeah. Like, childhood hero and i love this paperback book and i'm holding the genesis of it in my hands and seeing that he did the damn work right. he said how right. did the work yeah and john comes in and um he didn't say anything because he understood and he saw me there and um he said it's something isn't it oh man said, yeah it is something man what a oh. beautiful observation. That's all, wonderful. All, all of which is to say that the beauty of something wicked is that Charles Halloway himself is struggling as Ray struggled. He's struggling with middle age. He's struggling mm-hmm. with the fact that he's a janitor. He's not a library director as he was in the film. He is a janitor. Right, right. He's struggling with the fact that he doesn't understand his son, that he really wants to be his son. He wants to be a boy again. Yeah, he does. Yeah. He's struggling with with the end of life and whether he believes in God and whether he believes in evil. And you feel Ray's middle age struggle along with Charles Halloway. Right, right. That That's the beauty. Like, the plot itself, it's great, but it's an excuse for us to feel Charles Halloway's struggle. In, in essence, the, the book, Something Wicked This Way Comes, is Charles Halloway's temptation. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's everybody's temptation in the in the in the town, but we know Charles Halloway. So when he's tempted, and I put this in my stage show, uh, it's the centerpiece of it. Is this library scene? And Mr. Dark comes in mm. and begins by saying, "My name is Dark. Where are the boys?" And then you're like, "Oh, it's coming oh, down." Oh boy! <laughs> so when when he says to Halloway, people prowl. Come down, titillate, night sweat, and lick us over to lick their lips and think about investing in our special securities. You came, you prowled, and it wasn't just for curiosity. And then there's a pause, and Mr. Dark turns and says curiously, how old are you? And there you get to it. Oh, my gosh. That is... And, and he, he asked Halloway, would you like to be younger? And Ray says in the book, Halloway screams, no. Mm, right, right. And, mm. and Mr. Dark sees his weakness. And Mr. Dark says, no need to shout. It's nice to be young. Really, it is. And you can just feel Halloway's with Oh, my gosh. He's offering him the very thing that he would most like to have. Mm. At a price 
that Halloway might be able to live with if he just drowns himself in his newfound youth. He's given up his son, but he himself would be young, and he's thinking about it. And you can yeah. tell he's thinking about it because his heart beats louder and louder. Mm. So folks who are listening, read the book. Oh, yes. Oh, by but all means, please. Don't, don't yeah. tell me, oh, I saw that movie. No, you didn't read the book. It's <laughs> Thanks to Christmas Carol. The book is is infinitely more interesting and will stick in your craw yeah. longer than the movie. Oh, it's absolutely true. And that's the part that really, because films um, sort of by their nature – uh, to be accessible and marketable and all of these other things, they have to focus on the narrative beats of what happened. And yes. books, as you've so eloquently put it, have the luxury to go into the asides. They have the luxury to spend the time with the reflections, and and the poetry of the language is what really does resonate so profoundly. Um, there are two things, in addition to what you've already laid out, that, that stand out to me about Something Wicked is... The first thing I can remember, it was one of the books, this was just an exercise for myself, just a, a little sort of uh, self-edifying, uh, you know, self-aware thing that I wanted to do. Before my son was born, I specifically wanted to read uh, a handful of books that had strong father figures in them. And one of the books, uh, almost at the top of the list, was Something Wicked This Way Comes. And one of the reasons why I made it such a priority in that particular reading list was it's it's the only one that I can remember. I don't want to say it's definitively the only one because I'm sure there there may be others out there, but it's the only narrative that I can remember. A lot of times in horror films or in uh, stories of supernatural, uh, the children are kind of let in on something dark is coming, and mm-hmm. then they tell figures of authority, this is troublesome. You need to be aware of this. We, we need to fix this. Um, yes. And then, of course, the figures of authority brush them off. Oh, these kids these days or whatever. And Something Wicked This Way Comes is one of the only, if not the only, instance where I can remember where when the boys tell Charles Holloway what's happening, he immediately believes them. And yes. and, and on top of it, joins the fight. Uh, and I remember being so arrested by his trust in them and his recognition of what was happening in what he observed around him uh, to to fully embrace that, that was inspiring to me. There's also, speaking of these asides, there's a moment in the center of the book before the boys have told him what's going on, before they've let him in, when he only registers the trouble in like the distant echo of something that's going on with his son. But his son asks him that question and says, you know, will... You know, am I good? And mm-hmm. he starts talking to him, and he says, "You're you're the best parts. Of, of course, you're good. You're the best parts of me and your mother put together. Of course, you're good." Mm-hmm. And um, and then he says, "But will that help me hmm. when when the evil comes?" And his father looks at him, considers the question, and says, it, "It'll help." And then he asks, "This is the gut punch for me." And then he said, "Will it save me though?" And Holloway remembers for or he considers for a second, and then looks at him again and says, "It'll help." And I found that bill so profoundly beautiful because it's not this platitude of guarantee of, yes. uh, you know, just this superficial safety, but it is this sort of deep calling out to deep kind of echo that says it, it will help. You know, it, it will it will do good to be good. And uh, and and what a just a to me what a very affecting and profound thought because I think so much this is perhaps exploding things out beyond where they need to be but I think so much is about win and loss and winning and losing yes. um, that the 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 final end result of a thing is what so many people focus on to the degree that if something goes badly they try to find some sort of understanding or meaning in it. Well, why did it go that way? Why did it have yes. to happen that way? Yes. And, and, and tire ourselves out endlessly trying to dig into those, in, into those canyons um, instead of just sitting in the space where we might breathe and recognize it will do good to be good and it will be good to do good and et cetera, that, that it, will, it will help. It will produce something worthwhile, even if ultimately... You still get knocked out in the fight, even if ultimately you, there there is still a, a defeat. Um, and and anchoring ourselves in that in that place, I think, uh, is is substantially valuable. I think you just um, 
uh, you just laid out Ray's philosophy better mm-hmm. than I have in 90 minutes of stage time. Oh, come on now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, it, 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 will, it will do good to be good, and it's worth it just for that reason. Mm-hmm. That is indeed that is indeed the message. We're so fixated in this um, society in this world today on outcomes. Yeah. Um, how successful? Uh, how much? How much money? How successful? What was the final outcome? What happened? If you were telling someone about an endeavor, uh, you know, and I know this is an actor, and um, what's the first question? You know, oh, I'm an actor. Have you been anything I would have known? Or <laughs> the words, yeah. been anything big? I'm a writer. Oh, have you read anything big? Mm, you know, we yeah, go right. to what was the in, instead of what is that like? Yeah. You know, right. A more interesting question is, I'm a writer. What's that like? Mm. Um, I fix cars for a living. Oh, you know, you have a you're like a big dealership, or you. <laughs> <laughs> what is that like? Or an even better question is why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? What is it about it that you like? And then maybe I might learn something. Yeah, absolutely. You're yeah. right. It's it's not really about the. Well, it's an old cliche, isn't it? I mean, that it's the journey. Yeah. It's not about the outcome. No, I I wholeheartedly agree. We're very. We're very big on this show. We talk a lot about we we have a, a one of probably three or four little uh, repeated phrases, sort of a uh, touchstone things we keep coming back to. And one of them is um, uh, we we explore, we don't explain. So we may not mm-hmm. land at a at a you know a definitive conclusion or a definitive destination, but it's about getting there and getting there together and helping you know kind of helping each other up through the thing. Uh, at whatever that thing may be, uh, navigating difficulties, navigating uncertainty, um, and and doing so together, the journey versus uh, the destination. Um, if if you will, uh, I I could make this entire I won't for the sake of our listeners. I could make this entire conversation about uh, Ray Bradbury, um, and uh, and maybe I I will say this if uh, if the time comes, which I've been pushing for for a little while, if the time comes that we get the privilege to discuss a Ray Bradbury work and you're available i want to have you back on the show when nathan's here we can just like go go dive deep on uh, on one specific work i would love that very much but i want to ask you in the spirit of the what's that like um a little bit about some of your work i want i want to i've got a couple of ping questions um but uh to 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 bring us up a little bit uh, closer to the shallows for just a brief moment um what are some of your uh, what are some of your favorite horror films you said you work a lot in horror yeah. Um, what What are some of your just not even that you've been a part of, although that certainly is open for conversation. But just what are some of your favorite horror films that you that you love revisiting, or what what really gets you and really excites you? When I was a kid, I was a monster, um, so my sympathy has always been with the monsters. And I say it was a monster because it was different in just about every way that a boy growing up in rural South Carolina could be different. Mm. I had um, horrendous acne from an early age. I mean, uh, they called it chronic acne. I don't know what it's called now, but it's it's the scarring type, the mm. the disfiguring uh-huh. type with cyst, and um, it's it's calmed down now and just left a bunch of pock marks. But at the time, it was um, you know big cyst would appear out of nowhere. It was really rough. Mm-hmm. It was the kind of thing where people would say, "Can't you do something about your face?" We, oh, you know, God. and, and then people did say that. So there was that. Um, at the same time, I was I. I didn't know how to throw a football. Uh, I love books. <laughs> um, I love Sunday school. I was fascinated and knew all the answers. And uh, me, me, I know, I know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I made straight A's in school. Um, and I was a very large boy, too. I was very thin. Now my metabolism changed, but I was very big. Mm. So I was a fat kid, the ugly kid, the smart kid, and the sissy kid, all in one kid. Oh, my gosh. Um uh, so I felt extremely ostracized. You know, of course, sure. there was no of course. online community there. You couldn't look up in the phone book to see what you were because mm. it, there was, I mean, there was nowhere to see Cyclopedia Britannica. Yeah. What the heck? Mm. So when I discovered uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine at the time, edited by Forrest J. Ackerman, it really saved my life. Mm. As a consequence, the first horror films I was exposed to were those made long before I was born. Um, I read about Lon Chaney, who I'd never heard of before. Oh, wow, yeah. As soon as I had the opportunity, uh, the Masonic Lodge for Halloween, when I was about 12, showed some old-time silent horror films, and two of them were Nosferatu and the 1925 Phantom of the Opera with Chaney. Mm. 
And I made my grandmother take me, and she said, oh, you don't want to see those old things. I was like, oh, Mama, please, I've been reading about these. And I watched them, and they're on a bed sheet with a little projector oh. sitting on chairs in a Masonic fellowship hall. Oh, I watched man. Cheney, and it was as wonderful as Ackerman had said it was. So wow. Cheney was an early touchstone, and I think because of watching him do uh, all of his roles – uh, from Quasimodo to the Phantom to the Penalty, mm-hmm. I became fixated on this idea of the wounded monster because mm-hmm. I myself felt like a monster. Mm-hmm. Uh, the monster who had some inner self that was not allowed to come out because people only judge the monster to be a monster. Mm-hmm. That became my very favorite. So as a consequence, the Wolfman was my favorite. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. All variations of the werewolf were my favorite. Much more so than Dracula, because Dracula was big and powerful, and he pounced. But the right. wolf didn't understand what he was, but he was it anyway. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 Cheney's phantom only asked for one favor, which was, please don't look at my face. And that's the one thing that, you know, oh, I need to see your face. So mm, uh, mm. so the old, um, the, the, the original Frankenstein, um, yeah. the original Wolfman, despite its flaws, um, the Cheney films, those were my very, very favorites. Then going forward from there, The Exorcist set me back on my heels, and I've never forgotten it. Oh, yeah. That's my favorite film. Not even favorite horror film. That's 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 my... Uh, I always joke with people that have said it on the show before that my favorite film is The Exorcist. My second favorite film is It's a Wonderful Life, and if you can figure out what those two films have in common, you'll get pretty close to understanding how my mind uh, works. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I um, I wasn't old enough to see The Exorcist, and I just begged Miss Parsons at the theater to let me come. And she said, if you come for a matinee, I'll let you in the back door. But if you tell anybody, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> wow. So our little hometown theater. So I sat there and saw it, and then I came back for three more showings and memorized most of the dialogue. There's something about that movie that just oh, it drove me crazy. Uh, the original yeah. um, Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, it's, sure. Sure. horrendously frightening because there was an idea behind it the idea of don't go to sleep right, uh, right. and and you know I, I mentioned Salieri but Mozart felt to me like a horror film too Amadeus oh yeah 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 the Alice Foreman film felt like a horror film because of that beautiful framing with that beautiful Dick Smith makeup of the elderly Salieri that's just what I was thinking of when you said that. I was like, yeah, he's, he's yeah. got a, a, a kind of a monstrous visage there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So he definitely does. And and he's, you know, he's playing with the priest at the beginning and saying, do you remember this? Bum, ba, bum, ba, bum. Oh, yes, I remember that lovely tune. That was Mozart. Mm. You know, that'll never mm. be me. And then at the end, mediocrities of the world, I absolve you. And Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and, and he draws you into the mind of the monster because Salieri – devotes himself to God and asks only one thing, and that is to make music people will remember. And instead, the gift is given to this complete pompous ass. Right, yeah, absolutely. He's not even kind or humble or polite about it, right. about his genius. And uh, Salieri takes the crucifix and throws it in the flame and says, Gracias, Señor, gracias. And then he makes the turn. If you gave genius to this guy, I'm going to steal it from him. So uh, all of which to say is that I love wounded monsters and I love um, horror that has a psychological basis and the basis of which is some inner wound that the mm. character has. That's what I like. I That's, had yeah. zero interest in there's someone killing people and we don't know why. That's of no interest to me. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's a very, very profound answer. Um, and you're – so you, as I understand your filmography, sort of contextualizing it, um, your work in film, you are often called upon to play uh, a, a monster of sorts. You, yes. you usually spend a lot of time either under some makeup uh, or some yes. sort of some sort of effects. That's um, right. And so it, it does make sense when you talk about the way you're able to embody that and uh, and connect with that idea now that's that's not to say that the, your work has been exclusively horror i know i would i think it would be fair to say it's it's pr- uh, been primarily horror but you've also done uh, some material that i i want to give you a chance to speak to that's uh, uh, like i know there was a civil war drama from what a uh, few years ago called the retrieval yes which um i thought was a really compelling film um, and then you also had done a film with a with a, a longer title, uh, the Apostle Peter and the Last Supper, 
and my yeah, with, uh, Robert Loggia. I was the devil, of course. <laughs> it, it, uh, he was the Apostle Peter, but um, yeah, there were there were a couple of good moments in there. I thought, and one was um, it was uh, Satan who appears as this prisoner in the cell with him, is saying, "You'll deny him again," because Peter knows he's going to die, and mm-hmm. he says, "You'll deny, you'll do it again, you'll do it again. Mm-hmm. You did it before, you'll do it again." Wow! <laughs> and then and Logia, you know, with this great powerful voice, "I cast you out in the name of Jesus! I cast you out!" <laughs> and I was like, "Wow! I just got cast out by Robert Logia. <laughs> this is pretty <laughs> that's, awesome." That's not something many people can say. That's awesome. hey, I'll tell you, um, um, Logia, at he had the first beginnings then of um, the uh, I don't know if it was Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, so he was using cue cards. Oh, okay. And he could deliver a performance off a cue card that would leave you in tears. Mm. And you were like, oh, my God, this from a cue card? Wow. (laughs) Because he has instinct. Um, So he's a little bit, just just a little um, addled. Sure, Uh, sure. uh, And we're not... You know how it is that when it's when it's just beginning. So anyway, lunch, I I knew Logia's work, and I really, really wanted to, like, sit at his feet Mm -hmm. and said, you know, could I could I ask you about your relationship with the camera? And he just sits there. I'm sure he heard me and he said, go get me a ham sandwich. <laughs> I said, sir. So I'm in my demon makeup. You know, I'm going back to craft services and getting him a ham sandwich. And I bring it back to him, sits down, and I'm looking at him with my folded hands, and I'm thinking, now he's going to now he's gonna say the thing. And he looks at the sandwich, and he looks at me, and he says, is this ham? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's ham. Okay, now I'm going to get it. He takes the top off the bread and he says, doesn't look like ham. <laughs> and I said, I think I think it's ham. And he goes, oh, all right. So he starts eating and I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, I'm not getting anything. Oh, and so I, I walked away. He says, hey. And I turned around and I said, yes. He said, the camera is your father confessor. You got to tell it everything. You'll be all right. Oh, and then he my eats, goodness. He eats his sandwich. And I thought, wow, even in giving an anecdote, you <laughs> lost for all it was worth. And I'll never, ever forget those words because of the way he delivered them. Wow, that's an incredible story. <laughs> that, that's that, the good stuff. That is amazing. And you're right. I totally, if I were you in that moment, I would have been like, yeah, okay. He's, he, he wants to eat. I'll, I'll, I'll move <laughs> along. That is nice. <laughs> that is so amazing. That's great. I, okay. So uh, I don't know if you have any anecdotes from this because as of this, as of this recording, I've not yet seen the film, but, um, I know one of, your more recent uh, works that you were a part of was uh, Rob Zombie's newest sequel to um, The Devil's Rejects. The, his, his, the conclusion of his little, well, possibly conclusion now that sadly Sid Haig, Sid Haig has passed away, but um, the conclusion of his little trilogy, House of a Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects, and, yep. and you are in uh, Three from Hell. I want to uh, give you my bit of brief history with these films, and then I want to know uh, a little bit about what that was like. So I... Um, when I first saw, I did not see House of a Thousand Corpses until after Devil's Rejects had been released to uh, home video. Like I think at the time it was only DVD. Streaming wasn't the giant it was at the time that I saw it. So we, uh, some friends of mine and I had gotten together. We'd never seen these films. It was around a Halloween season. Everybody was in the mood for spooky films. And so we, we watched House of a Thousand Corpses. Now, at the time, and I'm a, I'm a pretty avid horror uh, aficionado, so I'd seen quite a bit. But House of a Thousand Co- Corpses was a little rough for me. Like, it was, it was, it was like, pretty intense. It was pretty gonzo, a very uh, a mesmerizing sort of uh, disjointed style, lots of vignettes, uh, shifts in camera angles and, cam- and film stock and everything. And, and so it was really a very different kind of film. But then we followed that up right away with The Devil's Rejects. And I remember being so interested in the fact that Devil's Rejects followed the same characters, but at this point they were on the run. They were being hunted by this uh, sort of mad sheriff who was angry that his brother had been killed by them. Um, And so I remember feeling in that moment like Rob Zombie's got some interesting 
things going on in terms of uh, just his thought processes and in terms of what he's what he's interested in in the type of stories he wants to tell now again i do not know just in full disclosure i don't because i haven't seen three from hell i don't know your context in the film i don't know uh you know how your player character plays into all of that I don't know how spoilery we want to get on this. We usually spoil everything. But uh, what was it like to be in in that film? Was that it was it just another job, or was there something a little different about it? It wasn't just another job, and I can't spoil it because Rob will kill me. I mean, that <laughs> no problem. Quite, sure. quite literally, kill me by not allowing me to be in any of his movies. <laughs> sure, um, sure. It's a privilege to work with Rob, and anyone who does work with Rob knows that you had better hew the line, or you won't be back. Mm. It, it, in uh, the, the the scene that I was doing. We had continuity like you have never seen before. Really? And most people know what continuity was, but if there's anyone who doesn't, I want you to understand the context of this. It's the person who, in between uh, takes, comes and looks at the actors, this wardrobe continuity, this makeup continuity, um, to make sure that everything is exactly as it was in the last take. Well, I mean, she was, this continuity person was looking at the corner of your lapels. She had photos of everything, one hair out of place. I mean, she, it was amazing. Usually you don't get that. Yeah, um, uh, it's very rare, even on a big film, to get that kind of continuity. And I, I whispered to her, I said, "You are on this." She said, "I better be, or Rob fire me." Oh wow! And I said, "All right." And I saw that in the way that he runs his sets. Um, mm -hmm. It's very clear that he knows what he wants. Mm -hmm. He's very kind, but he's not acquiescing. It's his movie. Sure. Sure, um, of course. And he's in charge, and so that's why everything's sort of stamped with his vision. Uh, he's he's also really an actor's director in that he wants you to bring to it what he hired you for. Mm, okay. So yeah. the way this came about was I got a call from my agent who said, um, Rob Zombie wants you in Three from Hell. You can say yes or no. I said, what's the role? He says, you don't get to know um, oh, okay. how big it is or what it is. Um, you can either say yes or no. Wow. Um, and, you're, and, and you're making scale. Everybody's making scale. Sure, sure. Of so course. yes or no? Yes. <laughs> of, course, <laughs> so, of course. And then they, um, on a Rob Zombie film, you don't get um, scripts emailed, so they're not easily shared. The, everything's paper. Mm, okay. Like it, it comes by courier if there's a change the old way. Oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah, so it's – it. It, it was a privilege to work with him. When I got there, we on the transpo van down to the scene, uh, I said, you know, here's how this is written, Rob. You want me to do it this way? And he said, oh, he said, no, I want he, he said, I want what I like you for, which is a quiet menace. Mm. I want you to bring that. And the role wasn't really written with quiet menace. He said, I want you to overlay what you do on top of this. Mm, OK, that's yeah. a very interesting challenge for an actor. Sure. So. Yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. It was great watching him work. It was great to see Mosley again. Yeah. Uh, Mosley and I got to work together right after that in a film which is just coming out. In fact, I think it debuted in Los Angeles in theaters last night um, called Devil's Junction, Handy Dandy's Revenge about evil ventriloquist dummies. Oh, nice. <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. and he had been. I did a film for Jordan McClure called Children of Sorrow, playing a cult leader. And Jordan's previous film had been Rogue River, which starred Bill and Lucinda, who are married in real life, as a husband oh. and wife team. Nice. Uh, so I had been wanting to work with Lucinda and wanting to work with Bill, and boom, there we were. And then a couple months later, it happened again with Bill. So it was sweet. a great experience all around, and uh, I loved it. That's awesome. Something that's uh, sort of a final note on Rob Zombie. Something that's always been interesting to me about him is it's so apparent, really, when you hear any interview with him that um, you had mentioned earlier the films that connected with you, uh, films sort of from before your generation, the older uh, material. And yes. it is so apparent when you listen to Rob Zombie and in really interview I've any interview I've ever heard him in. Um, it's so apparent that he he kind of knows his roots like he he knows going all the way back to like he had uh, you know obviously the, his band white zombie is uh, is is if i understand it correctly was patterned after the bella lugosi film that's but, right and um and so he's but he's very acquainted with like early horror films of the 20s and 30s and uh it's it fascinates me and I, I, I don't want to miscontextualize something because he may feel fine with it or it may be something that he, uh, you know, feels sad about or whatever. But I've heard that he really would love to make uh, – there was a book he had read about the last days of Groucho Marx. That's right. And, uh, and a non-horror a non thing, which I would be really – I mean, just unspeakably fascinated 
to see Rob Zombie's uh, style applied to something that was not exclusively in the horror realm. I'm sure there would yes. probably be some elements of, of suspense or menace or, or, or a macabre sensibility, but you know, a, a film that was not straightforward horror about the final days of Groucho Marx, I you know, I I really hope he's able to get that project off the ground or a similar project or something because as I said, it's really apparent to me in just listening to him speak um, how familiar and acquainted he is with that old style of horror, and uh, and so yeah, it's, he's he's a fascinating guy to me. I, I love hearing stories about him and and uh, thinking about his work and everything. But something... I, I I found that he, um, if I can add one more thing, yeah, yeah I, I found a commonality between he and Jamie Lee Curtis, who oh, I yeah. worked with just before on Screen Queens. Oh, that's uh, right. That's she right. directed I saw that episode. she directed an episode that I was in, and in that both of them are very very aware of their personas, and the mm-hmm. personas are not lies; they're just um, exaggerated portions of themselves. Sure, sure. That the fans enjoy, and they both understand that, and uh, they don't resent it that people want a certain thing from them. Right. They right. they, uh, they have their own private self is what i mean you know their own right, right. their own self and what uh jamie lee curtis talking about controlling a set we were shooting in la and this uh the set was a costume shop a really creepy costume shop and i was the owner of the costume shop um yeah. and so that this came about in a similar way i got a call from my agent who said ryan murphy wants you to do this episode of screen queens that Jamie Lee Curtis is directing. <laughs> um, here's the scene. And I said, Ryan Murphy knows who I am. Oh, oh yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, apparently he, he saw something. And she said, here's the scene. Put yourself on tape doing this. Nobody else is doing the tape, but he wants to make sure you can do what he wants. Hmm, okay. So, yeah. uh, so I did it. And they said, yeah, okay, come do it. So I came and did it. So we're, anyway, we're in this costume shop. So Jamie Lee is the director, and she's a star director, yeah. you know. She's and usually when you have a star director, they try to make everything all ready, so then when the person comes in, they can just sit in the director's chair and go. Right. Well, right. She, Jamie Lee doesn't roll like that. She didn't want to be just the star. Oh, okay. She wants to be the director. So they have everything <laughs> shot, and she comes in, and um, she. I said, uh, "Hey, Jamie Lee." She said, "I know who you are, and I want you to do exactly what you did. It's effing fantastic." <laughs> she learned is one of her. One of her uh, signature expressions, effing fantastic. Oh, that's awesome. So they walked her through the scene, and they said, so we're going to do this, 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 then we'll have an overhead shot here, and it's only three setups, and we're out. And she put her hands on her hip, and she said, no. <laughs> but she didn't say no like I'm stomping my feet. No, she said no like she was inspired. Ooh. Like, Frankenstein. she said, no, I'll tell you what we're going to do. And everybody just kind of looks at each other. She says, we're going to lay dolly tracks here. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. Oh, and was, my gosh. Says, and we're going to light. And I want a rim light here. Bah, 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 bah. And she says, and that's what we're going to do. Who's on board? <laughs> everybody said, I am, I am. Yes, of course. Oh, of course. Oh, she my gosh. Everybody yes. her immediately. She just took control of that set. And it was it was fantastic. But she had fans who came on the set and met her. And say, you know, I got to get a selfie with you, get a picture. Sure. And sure. that she understood what they, the, the Jamie Lee Curtis that they wanted then. So I'm always fascinated by people who are able to navigate all, in her case, three worlds: Jamie Lee, the actress, right, <laughs> the right. and then the private person. That's, that's and you know that's it's it's interesting that you bring that up. So you. Something that I have experienced, and I don't know, uh, my uh, breadth of people in the horror community is is significantly smaller than yours. But something that I've found is interesting. You said of uh, you said of Rob Zombie that that uh, you know he was kind. He was very in control of his set, but he was kind. Um, and then the story you've just relayed from Jamie Lee Curtis, she seems like such a, a a kind and amiable individual. So here's my here's my thesis or my um, uh, experience, as it were, is. I feel like the broader horror community, if you want to call it that, people who uh, kind of either engage in some aspect of horror filmmaking or creative arts uh, in, in the macabre sense, my experience of that is that in general, by and large, a large majority of them tend to be uh, kind and generous, very kind and generous people. More yeah. and and. and the reason it pings me is because I think the percentage of those is higher 
just by and large than sort of the uh, the percentage of average everyday folks who would be sort of notably kind and generous. Much um, more. It's because because we deal with death all the time. That's what does it. Yeah. It's the yeah. acknowledgement of death, the proximity of death, the recreation, the mimicking of death, the playing with death. It frees you. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think a lot of the cruelty in the world comes from fear of mortality. And when you're free from that, you're free to just be a simple human being and relate to other people the same way. That is so profound. It, it's and it's fascinating. It really makes sense. Um, you know, I think I think a lot about like again listening to Stephen King. You know, as we mentioned earlier, the like he's he's somebody that uh, in his, in interviews and when fans meet him and everything, they always express just how generous and amiable he is. And he's talked about in his work that that rehearsal of death. You know, that, yes. that getting into fear and horror is a rehearsal of of the worst of things and that That's we right. that we dance with these fake monsters, uh, these imaginary, these fictional monsters so that we can better cope and deal with the real ones and. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me. I think that's very true. Also, we're not obsessed with beauty in the horror industry because it's uh, beauty is the antithesis of horror. Right, uh, right. Uh, and so you know we're we're naked or half naked and covered in blood, and we have prosthetics on, and it's dirty, and it's yeah, yeah. You know, so we're so a lot of the vanity. Um, we don't have to worry about being beautiful. We don't have to worry about living forever. And, and when you don't have to worry about either one of those, it, it really does free you up spiritually. Yeah, and uh, so so maybe that's a good transition. Uh, I know uh, you know we're we're probably staring down the runway of of some conclusion for our time here, but um, the so that's something that obviously on this show we're very interested in. Even when I was launching the show, uh, and Nathan and I were first talking about it to people, that we were saying. You know, the question I would most frequently get when I when I would say I want to do a, a podcast about uh, horror and faith, about Christianity and the horror genre, and the most common question I would always get was, "Is there enough to even cover?" <laughs> Which I always uh, laughed whenever they would ask me that. But the other question is like, how like how can you do that as a person of faith? Um, and and dive so much into darkness. Now the I will say the 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 little pithy thing that I have, and then uh, I I, I just want to let you go on these subjects, and and I'll prompt you. But um, what I said to people, or if I've begun to say to people, is I say, you know, we're we're still looking for the same thing that everybody else who's seeking uh, to live their most faithful life um, is seeking. The one big difference might be that instead of looking at it in the main living room, we're looking at it in that scary box in the basement in the corner, the one with all the cobwebs on it that not too many people want to go near. But we're still looking for the same things. We're still pursuing the same things. Um, but what is it like when you are given the opportunity to engage with people on these deeper levels, which I know you and I are both framed, we, we desire to have deeper, richer conversations. We desire to have things that are that go beneath the platitudes of trivialities and, and really get into this is who we are and this is how this works and this is what we're after. Um, what is that like for you navigating you know this this world of monsters and madmen and uh, do you get a lot of resistance when you when you converse with people about that? Is that something that people continue to find surprising? Do you have challenges to it? What 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 is that like? I can summarize my set conversations in this way: If it wasn't for Christians, everybody would follow Jesus, because everybody's <laughs> fascinated by Jesus. When you stick to Jesus, you <laughs> stick to his life, the metaphors of his life, what he said, what he did. You're always on solid ground, and people will always, always be interested and yeah. you won't find yeah. much resistance mm. Mm. you start to get off into all of the crap we lay on top of it sure sure and, yeah and then you're turning people off completely oh well you know they shouldn't be turned off by the church well what's more important to you buddy that they love your church or that they love jesus right and you read that if people i know you are a minister let me preach for a second sure by all means <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the church I grew up in, so uh, when I was a kid, people would say, "Tell it, tell it." <laughs> that's right. Uh, talking about my Jesus. <laughs> that's right. Tell it about Jesus. <laughs> if you just stick to Jesus and you try to reflect Him, meditate on His life and teachings, 
relate to the world the way that he related. If you can go as far as to believe that he actually is who he said he was, ask him to come into your heart and change your life. You will not be a religious person. Mm. You will be a reflection of God's love poured through this imperfect, cracked, silly, broken vessel. And a lot will leak out. But mm. there'll be just enough that doesn't leak out, and he'll come through. And and the verse that typifies this, to finish my preaching, is if I be lifted up, I will draw him into me. That's what it means. Mm. That's, what, that's what it means. How did he die? Is this not a horrific death? People who say horror and darkness and, and facing evil have nothing to do. I'm like, have you read the Bible? <laughs> right. <laughs> have you read it? Exactly. You know, exactly. As early as Abraham, this horror of great darkness comes over him. That's the actual translation from the Hebrew. A horror of great yeah. darkness descends upon him. Um, throughout Throughout the Bible, people are facing darkness and trying to find their way through it. And I think that's something that, uh, like, has always because I get I get asked a lot. I've I've been a horror fan. I've just it's just been what I've drawn to, been drawn to since I was a little kid. You know, like uh, you know, first watching old episodes of Twilight Zone and and Outer Limits and Alfred Hitchcock yeah. Presents and stuff. And yeah. and uh, listeners of the show know by now I, I famously saw Psycho when I was only six years old, and it just it changed everything. And so um, I, I've always been sort of drawn to that. And I do get asked a lot because. I have friends whose kids are kind of into the macabre thing. They're kind of into it, and they'll be devout believers and everything, and they're like, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know if we should be watching this. I don't know if I should let my kid get into this. And I always tell them the same thing. I'm like, I'm like, look, I, some people can't quite um, handle it. And I, we, we tell people on the show, too, sometimes. It's like, look, uh, if this is going to offend your sensibilities, this is going to disrupt the navigation of everything, then just uh, just avoid it. Like, by all means, just avoid it. But if this is something that you're drawn to, then invite the Lord into whatever you're drawn to about it. Yes, And you might agreed. be fascinated with, with, what, uh, with what pops up. Ag- you know? Agreed. And I'm called upon to play the devil and variations of the devil in human form constantly. Mm-hmm. And it's because of my face, because the camera wants what it wants, and what it wants from my face is malevolence. Mm-hmm. Um, the stage is a different animal, but the camera wants malevolence. It's what I do. I'm getting ready to do two movies this month. In which I am an absolute human monster. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I say, Lord, come into this. You open this door. Yeah, yeah. I put my foot through. You opened it a little wider. I walked through. Every single day I'm in your word. Every single day I'm saying, lead me, guide me. You're not stopping. I don't feel a check. I'm walking in. I do this constantly, and I say, okay, now show me. What I am to do with this character, with these words, with this moment. And I used to think, oh, okay, well, what I have to do then is play evil so realistically that people will see the darkness and then they'll realize that there's the light. Mm -hmm. And okay, I hope that happens, but that's me laying out what should happen. And now what comes to us getting older is to say, I don't know what the purpose is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here and I'm telling you at any minute, stop me, check me. And I'm listening for those checks, and you do what you want with this. Yeah. And, and I was, I, I really like you advising people to take the same attitude towards viewing. Sure. Have you had stuff that you that you would uh, did feel like okay, I, I can't do this, or like you know, get into the thick of things? Have you had to navigate that before? Uh, yeah, I've had, I've only turned down two roles, and both of them were uh, ministers who were really, really bad, heinous people. Mm, and gotcha. oh, yeah. I played a cult leader who mm. was a liar, but these mm. people mm. were portrayed in the script as actually devout people who really were, had a relationship with the Lord for all, all the appearances, and oh, yet gotcha. these horrible yeah. things. And mm. that, I, that I won't do because... I know it happens in real life, but sure, sure. That stuff, and I don't want to add to it. But yeah, it, that makes sense. everything else I've done. There are um, two roles that I've done that haunted me that I wondered about afterwards. And one was uh, Father Simon in Children of Sorrow, the Jordan McClure film, because mm-hmm. he's a liar. And even when he said, "Now I'm going to tell you the truth," he was still lying. He never stopped lying. Mm-hmm. It was no core. The onion had no center. 
and that was very disturbing to me. And then the film called Circus of the Dead, where I played a um, a serial killer whose day job was being a circus clown. And it oh, sounds okay. silly, okay. but it, it wasn't silly. It was quite dark. And um, he had a nihilistic view of the world where there was no meaning. Again, the onion has no center. I think that's the most frightening thing to me personally. Mm-hmm. So both of those roles gave me nightmares and took a long, long time to uh, get over. Yeah, that makes sense. How and and this is funny just because of something you just brought up there. Uh, how uh, I guess the fastest through line to what I'm asking here would be, you know, do you use like a method level of approach, or is it more sort of the uh, the more European training of no, these are the lines and this is the affectation? Um, do you try to uh, connect the dots to things that you can relate to personally, or is it more of a you know these are uh, these are personas that I can kind of invent a a backstory or invent a motivation for and navigate that. Talk to me a little bit about your process for getting into I'm, some of those other roles. I'm not a good enough actor to have any process, man. <laughs> I, need, I, need, like, I need another word to start with because I'm a firm believer that because I love language so much, I believe that words will tell you how they want to be spoken, literally. Mm-hmm. If you yeah, live with yeah, a poem yeah. long enough, it will tell you how it wants to be spoken, a piece of literature, all the Bradbury stuff, um, yeah, all the scripture yeah. that I've done in performance. Um, Dickens. So I take the same approach with film. Even if it's a silly throwaway line, my job is to learn how that line wants to be said. So once mm-hmm. once that's done, then on on the day, I want to know where to stand, where to be in the light, that type sure, of thing. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And I want to know what the frame is. This is very, very important to me because I, I think cinema is an art form. Mm-hmm. And I want to know what is this frame? And what is my purpose in this frame? How can I serve this frame? Mm. That's really, really important to me. And then character comes last after uh, all of those things. Yeah. If, if, if I know the words so well that I can sing them, write them out, recite them backwards even, if I know where the frame is, how it's lit, if I understand why I'm there to serve the frame, then the character just seems to come. That's so. You've just stumbled into something that uh, ignited my brain a bit. That that this notion of how can I serve the frame? Yeah, oh yes. And you know, it's funny because we've talked before, even in this conversation, um, about how focused people are on on ends and and ultimate goals. And <laughs> there's something I find quite lovely about uh, you know you're talking about the craft of the moment. This is the shot. This is the setup. How can yes. I serve this frame? But uh, navigating so much of our work in in a similar mindset, I think, would be so profoundly helpful. Just how, how can I serve this task? How can I serve this moment? And I think we have a tendency to view even our own work as uh, sort of uh, a dead end in the long run or, you know, what's what's the ultimate goal? What am I doing here? And you're talking about this notion of service and, and the scriptures say to do everything you do, do it as unto the Lord. And how can I participate and best best affect what I'm called to do in this individual moment? Oh, it's Not, so you it's it's so true. Read in everything we do. And in, 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 in my job. Uh, this I, it also really 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 helps me with character if I've served every department well mm-hmm. as as an actor like um, the actor's job is to serve all departments we work for everybody you yeah, know so yeah. I, I'm serving the I'm serving um, craft services by keeping their table clean clean I'm serving makeup by being there on time and taking yeah. care of my makeup I'm serving wardrobe I'm serving my fellow actors I'm serving the gaffer I'm serving the electrician I'm serving the ad by being where I'm supposed to be. If I've done all of those things, then I have an attitude of service when I come to the shot. Mm, mm -hmm. And I'll tell you one other thing that really helps. And if anybody listening is an actor, try this. If there's another actor in the scene, give it give it to them. Mm -hmm. Support them. Just Mm -hmm. just be there for them. Don't worry about how you're going to look in the scene, because if you are concentrating on trying to support that other actor in the scene, I'll tell you what's going to happen when it comes to editing. The editor is going to look at you and go. Damn, that looks authentic. I'm cutting to that. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll get more screen time. But if you're trying to showboat and make the scene about you, yeah, the yeah. editor will find it boring and they'll cut away. So oh, give this away. In fact, the scene that you think, this is my scene in the movie, if that notion ever comes to your mind, that 
this is my scene is about as dangerous as don't you know who I am? Oh, wow. Yeah. You see that right. type of pride coming up. This is my scene. Make a conscious decision and I'm going to give it away. Hmm. If there's Man. nothing in the scene with me but a spoon, I'm giving the scene to the spoon. <laughs> well, and, and what's so profound about that is that it's. It is. We we actually have just talked in episode in an episode that has not uh, yet been released, but listeners will hear it after they hear this conversation that you and I are having. Um, uh, getting back to that notion of this whole idea of who seeks to save their life is going to lose it, and who seeks to lose their life is going to find it, mm-hmm. and 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 always being in this state of recognition of service and giving and relinquishing of power, relinquishing yep. of control and right. and releasing of that, um, that then uh, ultimately this, this is one of sort of the fundamental promises that the Lord has, has given to us of his faithfulness is, well, these things will be returned to you. Like these things are going to be given back to you, but if you seek to hold on to them, then it, it's going to tighten, it's going to kill it, it's going to separate yeah. it out from the core root. Uh, it, it's almost that vision that Jesus gave us of like severing the vine from from the mm-hmm. tree. And, and mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things that, uh, that I think is counterintuitive to our nature, because our nature, and it particularly in the kinds of things that people are talking about today, they're talking about, you know, like seizing uh, certain things and, and talking about trying to, uh, capture your moment and and uh, seize your day, which is a philosophy <laughs> that I've always been really really torn by because I do believe in 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 allowing people to feel empowered to make their choice. I believe you know my father, longtime minister, is retired now, but uh, you know had, had said like you know the cross is about Jesus dying for your right to choose. And, um, you know, that that's something we could unpack or not. But um, I've always felt very compelled by that notion of people feeling empowered to make their own decisions and, and not feeling the need to have permission to breathe. But I think there is a difference between someone um, uh, seizing or relinquishing or, or, or seizing their own agency, if we want to say that, um, and somebody seeking to control and manipulate the moment to their own ends and, and, and to their own uh, intentions. Uh, it's a really tricky sort of line to walk, but I think if we can dance in that mystery where it says, I have the power and the agency to relinquish to control, to be freely giving, uh, as the scriptures say elsewhere, Jesus said, freely have you have received, so freely give. If we have that that capacity within ourselves to say, I can be generous and I can be giving, uh, then it's amazing what we find there. There's a, uh, as a final button on that thought for me, there's a, is an old, do, do you know the uh, recording artist, Michael Card? He's a favorite of mine. Uh, I haven't but, heard of him, no. Uh, so it, lovely, very pastoral sort of work, uh, you know, like really, uh, this meditative kind of, um, I don't know. It's a very lovely and and uh, very sort of uplifting sentiment to to all of his work. But he has a song called "The Things That We Leave Behind," and in it, in each of the verses, he just captures a character who is called and compelled at the moment to leave behind what had always made them comfortable and safe. And the refrain is, "We can't imagine the freedom that we find from the things that we leave behind." Mm. And uh, and I do think that's something that we too infrequently meditate on, particularly. I mean, the climate these days is so volatile, and everybody's mad about something, and 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 everybody's fighting, pulling and scraping for something, um, and that spirit of I have the power to relinquish and I have the power to to give um, is something that I think we would do ourselves a great service to meditate on more and um, and to reflect on more, not even just in the day-to-day workings of being an actor or being a creative, being a writer. Uh, but if, if you're, if you're serving a coffee, if you are, um, you know, if you're, if, if you are as uh, Charles Holloway, if you're the janitor of, uh, of a particular place, just wherever you are recognizing the power and agency that God has given you to be generous and to be giving, uh, it's a, it's a really encouraging and very profound thing to think about. Something that I'm going to, Walk away from this conversation and think about much more than I am now, even. I think empathy, uh, compassion, and kindness are not optional for a meaningful and happy life. They're, they're not. And I've even come to the point where, you know, and I mean, forgive me for talking about Jesus, but I guess your listeners won't. No, of course. Matter, but, yeah. um, you know, 
People who are here talking about Jesus who are not kind, compassionate, and generous, I ain't got no time for them, man. I don't want to hear what they have to say. I'm just like, dude, if you're showing love, you're showing Jesus. And if you're not showing love, you're not showing Jesus. Oh, but I want to know. If you're not showing love, you are not showing Jesus. You cannot do those two things together. You can't be mean and at the same time show me Jesus. You can't do that. And that's something that I constantly want to ask myself. Every action that I'm taking, is this compassionate? Is it kind? And why am I doing this? Just because I want want to be a good person? No, because, because A, I'm trying to follow Jesus. Right, right. Because B, it feels better when I do these things. And C, I feel like I've served my master when I've done these things. And all of that is tremendously satisfying. You don't get the satisfaction of, oh, now everyone knows that I'm right. Or, oh, look how important I am. Or, oh, I got a thousand likes. But you Mm. get deeper satisfaction that lets you sleep at night. Yeah, it's so true. And recognizing, too, I think, uh, you know, the, the people who, I quote this this thing often, Rich Mullins used to say that if my if my ambition is to leave a legacy, then I will most likely leave a legacy of ambition. Ooh, um, I like that. It's yeah. true. I, I, it I, is, spent, yeah. I spent loads and loads of time um, trying to be famous. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. it was only because, you know, I was, you know, this really nobody kid. I, I'm going to be somebody. Mm-hmm. And it was only mm-hmm. when I finally said, you know what? I, I'm going to let this go. Yeah. That yeah. I really started to work regularly and have God take care of me in my career when I just gave it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's so worth noting about, uh, B- Bill, I could talk to you for three days in a row, and uh, I would exhaust you with all of my questions, with all of my <laughs> observations and my philosophy. Um, but uh, I, I really cannot tell you just how uh, delightful this has been for us to share a few moments here for the listeners. Uh, and uh, can we do this again? Can will you, will you come back to the show? Can we talk about either something specific or something general again? I just uh, I love these kind of conversations so much. I, I love these are the kind of conversations that I buttonhole people at parties or networking events in the corner they're like oh god how can i get away so yes any anytime i get to have one <laughs> i'm always down for it i've loved it i understand well uh thank you so much again um our social media cues are uh usually in the show credits but uh where can people reach out to you if they want to know more about your work if they want to contact you directly or whatever what's uh what's the best fast easiest or safest way to do that if you could just Google Bill Obers Jr., you'll find uh, my IMBD. In fact, on my IMBD, I like to check the list, and mm-hmm. I see today that I'm on Worst Actors. Oh, no! <laughs> um, icons of Horror. Huh. Uh, actors Who Don't Suck. Oh, okay. All and right. Weirdest Actors. Oh, So, wow. it's, yeah, it's, it's really, I always love, the Worst Actors comes up sometime, and I love it when it's paired with, like, top Titans of Terror, and then Worst <laughs> Actors. Yeah, I'm right behind. Um, who am I on Worst Actors? And then I'll, I'll, I'll say, I, I know you need to go, but I'm going to tell no, you. No, you're fine. You're fine. Who's on this? I'm number one. Oh, no way. Followed by Jared Leto, no Elijah way. Wood, Mike Myers, Martin Lawrence, Chuck Norris, and Steve Carell. Oh, my goodness. Oh, and Kevin horrible. Costner's right down there, too. It's like, guys, can you put one of them up ahead of me? I know, my goodness! How did who would think I, that that baffles my mind? Anybody who has seen you do anything, I don't know how. And that's I tell you what that is is uh, that's somebody that you cut off in traffic and they recognized you. That's all that is is that oh, they made oh, this IMDb right. list, you know. Now, because anyway, so I'm on IMDb, I'm, I'm on Facebook and all the other usual places. The place that I'm most active, like to contact, is probably Twitter, and I'm Bill Obers Jr. on Twitter. And I like Twitter because when I'm shooting, I don't go online much or try to stay off the grid. Yeah, but I sure. occasionally check Twitter, and it's easy just to write back. Oh, cool, cool. Well, Bill, this will definitely be happening again. Um, and uh, and I'm sure Nathan will have a whole host of questions for you as well. So we're going to find our next possible opportunity to have you back on the show. But I cannot thank you enough for taking some time for me today. Um, this is a real delight. This is a real treasure. And uh, I, I, I cherish you. I cherish our friendship. And thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I really appreciate it, Bill. Thank you, man. I appreciate you being my friend. God no bless. Problem. God bless. All right. Take care. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next week. The 
fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but not the end of the conversation. And you can continue the conversation in a variety of ways. You can follow us on Twitter at The Fear of God. You can like and follow us on Facebook or join the Facebook Fear of God discussion group. You can follow us on Instagram at Fear of God Podcast. Go to morethanonelesson.com to leave a comment on this post or any of the other official episode posts. Email us at fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com. Our theme music was composed by Lee Wright and Reed Lackey. Our podcast art was crafted by Jacob Hunt of jacobhuntcomics.com. Merchandise for the show can be found at tpublic.com. Just search The Fear of God Podcast, all one word. And last but not least, if you listen to us through iTunes, we would greatly appreciate a rating or a review. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week. Hi, everybody.